and welcome to Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Luke Cutford and special guest Harry, the Champagne Socialist. Hey. Woo. This week we're talking about sales, science, and market matters, but. For First, we have to thank our patrons. Don't thank we, Luke? you. You give us money and you tell us to do an episode on capitalism. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Thanks. Bite to the hand that feeds you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we also have a question today. And if you want to answer this question, get down to the comments on YouTube or the comments on Spotify. Or uh, if you're not on either of those places and you're listening somewhere, here's what you need to do. You need to start a business. I don't care what the business is. Okay, you just start a business, right? You pay the people that are working for you less than minimum wage. It seems like it's illegal, but it's probably fine. It's probably fine, okay? And once your business has become a juggernaut like Apple or Disney or the other one, uh, buy Disney, just buy it, okay? Buy Disney and then produce a film and the answer to your question will be the tagline of that film. We'll probably see it. Thank you very much. The question is, do you like capitalism? Do I like, do I like <laughs> capitalism? Um... <sighs> No. Do you like like capitalism? <sighs> a bit controversial, isn't it? <laughs> Are you going on a date with capitalism? Uh, we're not really exclusive yet. Okay. We're, we're sort of trying to figure it all out. Really, it's a bit of a learning curve, I must say. Different, a very different experience with it's, what I'm used to. I'd say it's an abusive polyamorous relationship. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know anything else, so I'm a bit of a Stockholm syndrome capitalist. Uh, but on balance, I would say uh, I think we could do better. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, that's some that's, radical that's, that's, talk that's, right that's here. a bit political. That's a little bit. I think things could potentially be better. Wow. Curious. <laughs> do you say that and yet you uh, engage in society, Corey? Wow, mm, yes. I am very smart. It's almost as though one of my criticisms of society or, you know, the culture, this thing that we're doing is that you have to engage in it. Yeah. Mm. You could live in the jungle. Uh, and yet you choose not to. Suspicious. I, I don't know if I can legally live in... Th That's not the point. Why don't we get into this episode and actually uh, talk about it? The reason that we are doing this, by the way, the reason we thanked our patrons, as I said, is because they voted for this episode. Uh, if you want to see something that is more about different parts of capitalism and how it relates to different things within science or outside of science or whatever, let us know. Uh, and we'll probably do that because this is a, this is a very deep mind to... Mine. <laughs> Minefield. Is that the term you're looking for? Yeah, let's go yeah. for that. Let's go for that. And if there's something that capitalism loves, it's a deep mine that it can yeah. mine. <laughs> <laughs> We've made plenty of jokes about uh, capitalism, but there are probably a lot of people uh, listening, uh, me included, who don't know how to define capitalism. Would one of you like to do that? Well, I did economics, so um, <laughs> I should be able to do that. You hope so, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, but probably not. I probably can't do that off the top of my head, but it's definitely like one of the features of capitalism is to do with um, sort of being able to own the means of production and being able to charge people for the use of the means of production um, without sort of you having to do any work. And that's sort of the function, like one of the functions of capitalism is sort of money flows to people who aren't doing anything uh, to earn it um, because they own the means of production, which they may have got through earning it in the past or through their ancestors earning it in the past. Um, but right now they are not. And these memes of production. Luke, no. What, what are, are they lol caps? <laughs> are they rage comics? Are they something that isn't 20 years out of date? <laughs> <laughs> They're actually doge, doge curry. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Do you want to add to that at all, Harry? There's um, nothing I feel like I can really add to that. I completely agree uh, with what Luke is saying. Um, it's yeah. an incredibly exploitative system. Um, that we've sort of become used to and the idea that we can sort of break away from it and go down a different path is kind of laughed at. And there's almost this idea of, well, in order to break away, we sort of have to follow the path of capitalism to a certain extent. Well, yeah, I find that the criticism that often comes up is capitalism is fine. Yeah. You're all just doing it wrong. Yeah. You know, it's it's not a problem that uh, market forces drive things towards being terrible. We just need to have more rules. We need to preempt every single problem with capitalism and then solve it. And also sometimes not solve it, right? Like it's, um, it's, yeah, it's weird to look at something that's obviously broken and everyone, almost everyone can admit that there's a problem uh, and the solution seems to be just keep doing it until it's not a problem anymore. Yeah, well, it seems to be with you and your sort of, uh, sort of your, even like your millionaires, billionaires of the world will say, well, no, everything's fine. You just need to work harder and do this. And he's like, you know, I'm a self-made billionaire. It's like, what, did you exploit all the workers by yourself? Like, what the f 
what's going on there. <laughs> Single-handedly, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, <laughs> for, you know, I, I raised from the mud. Yeah, no, by throwing mud at everyone else. Well, I had a look at Britannica, so I can give you the definition from there. They say, uh, capitalism, an economic system uh, dominant in the Western world since the breakup of feudalism, in which most means of production are privately owned and production is guided and income distributed largely through the operation of markets. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, it's a difficult thing to describe what capitalism is without sort of comparing it to other things. Um, oh. And just a recommendation from me, if you want to figure out what capitalism is or where it came from, uh, don't ask a capitalist because they're very bad at doing that. They're very bad at explaining where it's come from because their sort of thing, yeah. as I'm sure you've heard, is that capitalism is just sort of the innate human uh, instinct. It's what we want to do and everything up until, you know, the 16th uh, to maybe 18th century, you know, everything before that was people trying to do capitalism, but the system keeping them down. And as soon as all the things that stopped capitalism from happening went away, capitalism just naturally happened. Once we got rid of the uh, the Catholic Church holding power all over the Western world, like, yeah, suddenly everything just became great. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Honestly, the Black Death came in clutch. Like, honestly, <laughs> without it. <laughs> yeah. But I would recommend uh, The Origins of Capitalism by um, Ellen... Cannot remember the rest of the name, but it will be in the description, uh, as with all of our sources, so go and check that out. Um, but the International Monetary Fund, uh, which is a big group of... You don't need to know what it is, to be honest with you. I could sit here and explain it the to you, IMF. but it's going to bore yeah. you. Yeah, the IMF. Like You know what it is, and if you don't know what it is... It's big money group. UN involved. Don't don't worry too much about it. They know money. They're talking about they're talking about money. Uh, basically, they give a few pillars that capitalism is sort of founded upon. Um, so self interest, competition, a market mechanism, um, freedom to choose uh, when it comes to consumption, production, investment, and limited role of government. Um, and we can go into what those all mean in more depth. Uh, but does anyone want to dive in and explain one of them? Please list them again. I'll pick one. Uh, you can explain what self-interest means, Luke. Oh, okay. We did this recently, actually. Um, You're very self-interested, aren't you? Uh, no. <laughs> um, so self-interest is basically, it's part of the models that are used um, in economics, but it's to do with modeling people's behavior as sort of maximizing for one or several, I guess might be called payout metrics or might be called just sort of interests, right? So like maximizing their own um, financial security, maximizing their family's financial security, maximizing the, it can, it can expand out to like maximizing the security of their community. Um, for, it, can, it doesn't have to be just what it looks like on the surface, which is extreme selfishness and self-interest. But ultimately it is um, because even even when economics is talking about like self-interest in, in the terms of like creating a community, it's really ultimately because you want to live in a community. So you are self-interested in the experience of being in a community. So you're still, even when you're being self selfless by fostering a community or fostering a family, it's ultimately in your own um, because of your own goals, your own self-interested goals. I understand that I have just defined that using the word. Well, no, but this is the whole <laughs> argument with like privatization, the argument that, you know, if you privatize a public service, for example, and that you're taking it away from government and that a company can run it better because, you know, they have more time to focus on it. Mm. And ultimately the community that they serve, let's take like the railways, for example, um, where... Those yeah. things that are good and work. Yeah. yeah. No, they're great. Yeah. No, Avanti <laughs> West Coast, suck your mum. Yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> Is that a misogynistic? I'm asking two men whether that's a misogynistic. No. This, this is the argument that a private business can run a public service better because they have the time to focus on it. The issue with is is that particularly with like the railways, railways, for example, there's no competition. So companies like Avanti West Coast, for example, which run horrendous services, will keep winning government contracts mm. because you know there's no competition available. You know HS2, which is you know good whilst it was in practice or in a sort of a, in development stage. Um, there, as you said, there's no competition. And obviously a business, their uh, whole ethos is trying to maximize their profits. Mm. You know, the, the the care for customers is kind of secondary because, well, where else are they going to go? Are they going to walk? Are they going to drive? Yeah. That's that's the thing. And then someone else will then benefit from their, um, from their, their leaving their custom. No, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, that's the key point there. I was going to bring up about competition, right? The idea... Uh, when it comes to capitalism with competition is kind of as you're saying, you know, if you don't like this thing, well, you can go to someone else that's providing the same thing. Mm. And that will then drive all of the sort of competitors to be the best they can be. But um, it doesn't really work when you've got essentially a monopoly, which is what yeah. we're talking about here. Yeah. Another thing, right? Uh, this is probably I'm saying this to be a, a short, a real, um, a ticked talk, if you will. Um, <laughs> monopoly as a game is is not 
is not what you think it is. Monopoly is making fun of capitalism. The entire point of the game is to say, this sucks, right? This sucks. Do you know what capitalism did to Monopoly? It bastardized it and made it a fun game uh, to hate your family with. But then, you know what? Look, uh, we always win in the end because Monopoly is still a game that makes you fucking hate capitalism uh, just via hating yeah, but it turns you anyone into a you right, play it with. It turns you into a right little Tory, though. The oh, second eye on the water yeah. works, that's it. Like you, you are, you're my bitches now. Like I'm taking you. Like nah. there's nothing that, I, that there's nothing that you can do. See, this is why you're the champagne socialist. Because <laughs> me, when I play Monopoly, um, I, I tear the system down from the inside, like bringing it back to the whole sort of competition thing, yeah. right? I mean, that is, we're gonna get into the science at some point, right? But I want to talk about capitalism as a whole first, and I feel like there are many criticisms criticisms that are just sort of swept to the side, and the competition thing is one of them, right? You know, the idea. Just go somewhere else. You're so right. Well, you you if you can't go anywhere else, what yeah. are you going to do? Um, and that exists in so many different ways, right? The idea as well is that workers, right? Uh, they've got the freedom to choose, you know, where they work. And so, oh, they're not offering me enough money. I can go somewhere else. No, you can't yeah. necessarily, right? Like jobs are not available to just everyone, and the means that uh, you know the means to acquire a job are not available to absolutely everyone. Right? Well, Some jobs need a university degree. Not everyone is able to go to university. Yes, there are sort of bursaries and grants and uh, loans and everything. But like, if you need to support your family or you still need to support yourself or you're going to go, you you want to, you know, uh, apply to uni in the first place or you need to get the grades or have the time to spend to get the grades to get to uni, right? Like, it's not accessible to everyone remotely equally. Well, this is what our government is sort of with their recent attacks on the disabled community. Uh, sort of what people with health conditions, as they've so eloquently put it. But it's really targeting disabled people with their scheme saying, you know, if you uh, enter one of our intensive schemes and you don't find work, then you'll have your uh, welfare payments cut. And you think this is, you have ran this system for the last 13 years. What faith is there going to be? And we're talking about people losing access to medication that they might need that may have been on because they're unemployed for a long period of time. Um, and again, as you said, like the idea of retaining jobs, we keep hearing, you know, there's, there's record job vacancies, but in what sectors? Sectors mm. that may not be applicable to certain people. If you're wheelchair bound, there's certain jobs that you won't be able to do. And I think what happens is we have, they, they this, this government in particular has done it very, very well, where they are pitting two marginalized groups against one another. So you've got the disabled community and people in the working classes and people who are just on the breadline, just scraping it. Um, and instead of blaming the people on top for the fact that, that, you know, they are just barely getting by, they're being told, well, look at the person that's on welfare. Mm. But, you know, look what they're doing. Like nobody chooses to be disabled. Uh, at some point in our lives, we will be either uh, permanently or uh, momentarily disabled. Mm -hmm. And it's not a life that anybody chooses. And yet, you know, we are told to blame these people for the, our country's ills. Yeah. And I mean, if I could add to that as well, it's uh, a lot of people think disability, uh, just physical disabilities and whatnot, right? Yeah. You can get payments from the government uh, for having ADHD or autism that gets in the way of, you know, just living your life, right? Personal independence payments. Um, and what's really interesting about that is if you look into it, there's about a 50% um, acceptance rate to it. So with ADHD, if you have ADHD and you qualify for all these things, uh, about half the time you will not be given this sort of um, free money from the government essentially. And when you read the sort of, um, when you read sort of people's experiences there, what they'll do is try and catch you up. You get a month to fill in a form, right? You call up and you've got a month to fill in a form and send it back. For someone with ADHD, really difficult, right? Especially when you've got to get someone else to do it as well, and it's like pages and pages and pages. And then you've got to make sure that um, everything you say matches with everything else. So if you say one thing that uh, sort of puts you uh, saying, oh, well, sometimes I'm capable of doing this. Yeah, the person they'll jump on the that. Person, yeah, the person who's assessing it. I mean, their job essentially relies on them not giving this out to absolutely everybody that applies. And it's interesting so you mentioned the people that are assessing it. This is, isn't actually done by the government. It's outsourced to private companies. So Serco, who ran Test and Trace, that amazing, thing that we all uh, <laughs> we all benefited from um they in the early 2010s uh were outsourced a lot of uh pip assessments mm. um and they were actually found they were guilty and they were banned from having government contracts for i think either four or five years because they were found to have contributed to the deaths of vulnerable people mm. um and yet they were trusted to use a test and trace system uh, to provide for our country but you know that's capitalism for we'll you make the same mistake twice no, surely no, right, yeah, right, right you know. how many people died because of covid what was it 150,000? at least 10 yeah. Probably, at I least. don't know. There's one thing you guys are all forgetting, though, when you're criticizing capitalism here, um, and that's that that's another story. Okay, right. Luke, <laughs> since you brought this up, why don't you, why don't you explain your little joke there? Yeah, sorry, Harris, you won't know what this is, and some people won't know what this is. So Sabine Hossenfelder, who's a, 
a YouTube um, science educator, um, decided to make a video called Cat Capitalism is Great, actually, um, in which she basically um, ran through sort of basic economics about how capitalism is, is supposed to uh, yeah. come like end up with good outcomes. And then she comes to a bit where she's like, um, now, obviously, uh, this is a possible reason why that won't work. But that's another story. Mm. And then she like does another thing about like how free markets might end up working, like, making cheaper things because yeah. of competition. And then she goes, now obviously somebody might get a monopoly, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> and then like, oh, and go and governments are supposed to um, like, regulate markets, but that's another story. What do you think <laughs> the thought process was behind that video? It's difficult to say though, isn't it? Right? I mean, the title it was "Capitalism is Good." Let me explain, and she didn't really explain why it was good. I genuinely think, based on all the other, like, all the sort of other things we've seen from her, and this was sort of last year, so it was, uh, who knows what's happened since then, but um, I genuinely think that she thinks of herself as a realist and she wants to view these situations and be like, well, realistically, we can't change this. We can't overthrow this system, so we need to work within it, right? Mm. And then the only thing you could do, and that's your conclusion, is kind of ignore all of the things that disagree with that conclusion. You know what I mean, right? Like capitalism fundamentally um, can't really exist without inequality. Otherwise, there's not really a drive to do anything. Oh, of course. In the system, yeah. in the system that exists, right? And I'm not saying that you know um, people need inequality as a drive to do things. I don't think that's true. I think within this little this little game that we've set up uh, that everyone has to play, that is like those are those are the rules. Like if you function according to how capitalism models that you function, then if you were like in a nice situation where you had no reason to go and work, then you wouldn't if you behaved according to the way that the economics sort of models your behavior. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, why do you think we have homelessness? You well, know, yeah. homelessness is a political choice. The reason that we have people starving, freezing and dying on our streets is because it serves a political purpose. It serves a purpose to say, look, your life might be shit, but look, it could be worse. Oh, yeah. And that's what we seem to hear. So when you have people like Suella Braverman say, you know, home, homelessness is a lifestyle choice, it's like, no, it's not. And people will latch on to that and blame people, again, for, for our country's ills. You know, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, for, for all his flaws, said the first one of the first things he would do as the prime minister of this country would be to end rough sleeping. And mm. it is perfectly possible to do. We proved it during the pandemic that we could end rough sleeping. We put people in accommodation. And if you want to be an economic hard ass about it and a proper uber capitalist, you think about how much money we spend on uh, homeless people uh, using public services like the NHS, for example, mm. when they become ill. We could pretty much end that if we put them in accommodation and they weren't starving, freezing and dying on our streets. Uh, but no, it serves a political purpose. Well, yeah, it's the carrot and the stick, isn't it? Yeah. The carrot is... Look, you could be Elon Musk if you want. You can't, um, unless your father owns a diamond mine or an emerald mine or uh, I don't know. Whatever. Well, we have the same twenty four hours in a day as Beyonce. Don't remember. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't forget that. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Um, now remind me. Stop um, the resources, how many, Janet. <laughs> how many, um, how many employees does Beyonce have to uh, take away all of the all those hours a day that you know we would spend cooking or um, going places or shopping? All of these things that Beyonce doesn't have to do. You know. Um, yeah, I mean. I think what we're kind of talking about here broadly is that capitalism doesn't really work uh, the way that it says on the tin, right? Um, to just go through uh, the rest of these sorts of things, right? We've got self-interest, which Luke already sort of uh, spoke about, which is uh, the idea there is that, you know, um, everyone operating under their own self-interest within this system um, creates sort of moves resources sort of where they need to go, right? Um, and you can co basically coordinate people uh, despite them not being sort of centrally coordinated that's broadly the idea there if someone is if someone wants to look out for themselves you just need to create the conditions wherein everyone looking out for themselves uh makes it good for everyone yeah these conditions are not that but they may exist at some point who knows but yeah the idea is like it's, it's a sort of art form to uh make everybody's uh incentives align with the common good incentives if you could do that then you wouldn't have to tell people what to do. They would do the thing that's best for them, and then the sort of um, manifestation of everyone's um, uh, self-interest would be also what's good for the common interest. If you could do that, it'd be, it would be absolutely amazing. Like, it, it is ultimately, like, it's a distributed network, right? Mm. And it's very desirable, but at least the way we're doing it now, that is not what happened. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> well, I, would, I would argue that, that that was never the point, like trying to serve everyone's interest. You know, we're talking about constant, if you talk about concentrated wealth, for example, 
you know, and we want to sort of conserve it. The idea that, you know, when we talk about sort of ending like world hunger, for example, or help it or trying to alleviate people out of poverty, it's not that there's enough, there's not that there's not enough money to go around and help people. It's that the rich will never be content with what they have. And they're always seeking to maximise their income, as I suppose all of us are to a certain extent, but for different purposes. I was thinking about this the other day, and I, I don't remember if I asked you this question, Luke, but I think it's an interesting question, which is how much is the sort of, What's the largest amount of money, the smallest large amount of money that you could make and be comfortable? Do you know what I mean? So like uh, once you once you go past this point, you're like, I don't really feel like I need any more. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to buy any more clothes. I don't want to do any. Like, I'm happy where I am. I think it's that's a really like if you if you ask someone what that number is, mm. you're going to get a range of things. But the fact that there are people with like billions, even, you know, like millions just kind of sitting, doing nothing. Yeah, it's like. We don't really need that much. No one really needs that much to be comfortable for one thing, um, happy for another, um, and survive. Yeah. As, as you know, if you're looking at those three different levels, right? Like no one needs that amount, and yet people have it because there's nothing really stopping them. But that's the thing. I mean, like with happiness, it's all subjective as well, isn't it? You know, I know people that don't have much in terms of uh, sort of financial assets, but they're happy as anything. They're content with their life, and yet I've known people who are quite well off who are depressed as anything. And I guess it is all sort of subjective. We can talk more about yeah. that later, but I think a lot of that comes um, as well from sort of the pressures that we have uh, around us, right? I mean, we talk about uh, the wealth or how well a country is doing based on GDP, which makes no fucking sense, to be perfectly honest. It makes no sense because um, in, in terms of um, if you want to, you know, if you want to look at how um, happy or healthy or uh, all of these things, that, you know, all of these sort of metrics of living a good life, right? they don't necessarily correlate with no. the one thing that we use to judge all countries. Um, and as well, yeah, like people being, like having money and not, you know, um, and not being happy. I think we, again, the culture that we have is very sort of materialist, consumerist. And if you're in that mindset and you're constantly chasing more and more and more, you are never going to be happy. And the idea of people having less and being happy, like, yeah, you can still be happy with less, but also if you're having to work every day just to survive, it's kind of hard to have the time or the space to really feel any good feelings about that. You can still get worth out of doing other things, you know, um, things that don't cost money. And that's kind of the point, right? That you don't need to have a shitload of money to do things that uh, make you feel um, good. And you don't need to have an incentive of money to do things that, you know, make you have a feeling of worth, right? This idea of um, sort of incentive, uh, sort of the incentive being sort of innovation or profit, right? Realistically, it's not innovation, it is profit, right? It's um, it's not about making things more efficient um, for the for efficiency's sake. It's companies wanting to maximize profit and they'll be more efficient, but if more efficient is firing all of their workforce and creating a sub a standard product that breaks, you know, every other year, so people need to buy more and more and cutting costs wherever they can until the government tells them not to or busting unions so that, like if it's any of those things, yeah, yeah. right? It's good, they're gonna do that too. Can I just quickly share this really weird thing? So um, because I'm self-employed, I manage myself and my wife's eventual pension. And so I have like I have this app where I put money aside for us to have in, in retirement. And every so often it will send me a notification that just makes me so depressed. And the other day it said, Spotify stock rate rises 9% as they announce they're cutting 1,500 jobs. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's so... I, I, like, I know why it rose 9% because mm. they're going for efficiency and efficiency makes more profit. But that's so depressing. Like, it's like, I mean, you know when... You, you always see it in like American news where they like post a feel-good story where it's like, oh, seven-year-old uh, child ro uh, raised like... $20,000 for their two for their two year old brother's uh, heart surgery and it's like hang on why did why they was have a 7 year old having to raise 20 grand <laughs> yeah it's, yeah. Like, uh, it's like why we got to do games yeah. to, like why we got to why we got to do this like, that's not a feel good story that's like a fucking damning indictment of the uh, american healthcare system <laughs> or lack thereof yeah. yeah i mean yeah and that's i think that's the that's the point all of this stuff we're talking about here right people will say oh well communism's worse this is that's worse this is not an episode where we sit here and say, socialism, do it, or communism, do it, or feudalism, let's bring it back. Absolute because... monarchy, let's fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, not the point. The point is that like this thing that we are doing sucks right now. It doesn't work. Um, and ultimately, a lot of the arguments for it kind of ignore the realities of it. And the, the idea is just to point that out 
uh, not say here is another option um, because we don't really we don't we don't have the time to do that for one thing but we don't need to have a perfect solution to point out uh, a, an obvious problem um, and you know we could still work there's the there's the idea of like moving towards socialism within a capitalist system right there are ways of doing these things that aren't outright just revolution overturning everything and like you know chopping off everyone's heads right but again the point is not to uh, come up with this is what we should be doing it's just to get people on board with the fact that what we're doing right now is is not great is not the best thing necessarily and yeah. I, I feel like uh, you've but probably seen this that thing. people say this is our best this is our best option. See, I don't think they do. I think they don't. I think they don't even admit that. I think most people don't even admit this isn't working. It's not great. It doesn't make even like the most bare. It doesn't provide like the most bare essentials for every person, which it absolutely could do, or we do have the money and resources to do. But but what what else can we do? There's nothing else we can do. I don't think at least our polit politicians aren't honest with us and mm. to say like. Oh wow, this is a really difficult problem to solve. We're in a competitive system. If we as one country decided to become benevolent, other countries would absolutely destroy us because they're carrying on doing cap capitalism. They're not honest with us like that. Mm. They just go, it's it's actually really good. And anyone who says it isn't is a flipping commie. <laughs> well, they basically do this great thing where they kind of create a problem and then get surprised that the problem exists. Ian Duncan Smith is the best example who um during in uh, with the coalition government uh, introduced universal credit uh, which completely revamped the way that welfare payments uh, were distributed and it was awful for people um, it was past austerity austerity which took the lives of 330,000 people mm. um, so when George Osborne has confetti thrown at him you like you just look at the amount of lives that were lost as a result of policies that he created as chancellor and Ian Duncan Smith recently expressed concerns about um the uh, about children in this country and about this or their education the kind of lives that they were living and it's like well hang on you created these problems mm. you laughed in parliament about creating this sort of stuff you voted for this and that now you're going hang on what's going on and they always blame lockdown lockdown's like the great thing that they can all now blame for the situation of our country you know cost of living lockdown um state of the nhs lockdown right state of their man's cabinet lockdown right <laughs> they can get away with it and people on our media class will just ru run along with it because they hated lockdown and it wasn't in their interest to support it you're so right i think ultimately there's always going to be a scapegoat right um and it is good to it is good to like understand these problems and point them out um and yeah i mean we've pretty much gone through everything right i mean to kind of I kind of want to talk about like a sort of inherent, I think, contradiction within the idea of capitalism, right? Wherein we've spoken about all these things, sort of competition, self-interest, and how they're not really the way, they don't really work in reality the way um, they ostensibly should. Um, when it comes to the competition, like we said, competition doesn't necessarily always exist, right? You know, you if you quit your job, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you you can't quit your job and just find a new one yeah. straight away. Like if there's a buffer period, you're screwed, right? You know what I mean? Like, so you don't always have that freedom, especially if, you know, you're living in a country wherein you got to pay kind of out of pocket for healthcare a lot. You can't necessarily, you can't afford something, uh, you know, unexpected coming along. So that supposed freedom isn't really, fr isn't really all that free, especially when, you know, um, there is a living wage and the minimum wage are two different numbers. Yeah, uh, the, <laughs> idea, the, the idea that the national minimum wage is enough to live on, this is what they always say. I remember Jeremy Hunt the other day was saying, oh yeah, we're raising the minimum wage by one pound. It's like, but the price of everything else is going up by two. Mm. So you're not going to feel it. And this is why when we talk with unions, for example, that are fighting for proper uh, fair uh, pay and terms and conditions, this is why they're asking, when you look at, the, the, they're asking for like, what, six, like junior doctors, best example, mm. uh, do, or just doctors in general, they ask for a 35% pay rise. And people go, what? That, that's, that's, that's ludicrous. That, that's outrageous. How can they ask for that much? Well, if you look since 2008, their pay in real terms has been cut by 35%. Mm. And, you know, if you were owed money, you would want the amount of money that you're actually owed. But we're made to feel guilty about asking for, well, what we're actually owed. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, like phoning in sick, for example, for work. You ever had to do Oof. it? Like, you feel shit doing it, even though you're ill and you feel rough. But because it's kind of been great to you, you must work, you must work hard. You can work through your illness. And that's why, you know, things like COVID, for example, became were sort of bad because we've it's been ingrained in our heads. Like, you know, 
We have to work. We have to do everything. Yeah, and more than just ingraining your heads, if you work in the service, any service industry, um, you know, bars or yeah. whatever, um, bars especially, I find, if you are ill, I mean, I think I'm pretty sure this is a, a law. If not, it's a guideline that you have to follow. I can't remember. But um, if you've kind of had diarrhea or vomited, you're not allowed to work um, yeah. around food for the next um, 24, 24 hours. hours. I, <laughs> I honestly don't think you'll find anyone like that has worked in a bar who has actually had to actually been able to follow that rule. Like the idea, the thing is, if you're not throwing up currently, you are working essentially, right? And they'll try and find a way around it. But oh, could you do this instead? Yeah, or perhaps do this. Like I remember once there was one time I once phoned to my work sick because I had a sore throat, and the fact that I had to phone in like sort of people like yeah, and I can't speak. Mm. And then I got a call from like the other manager above. Why aren't you in? I've got a sore throat. You sound okay to me. I'm having to strain myself at the moment. Mm. Like they're like, you can come in, you can do this. I can't because that's the thing. When you got sore throat, you just got to rest. Like is even though it's just talking, mm. but it's like you got to sit down, lay down, relax, and then after a day or so, you feel fine. You're back to work. But that doesn't. Slide. That's actually a really good example of self-interest. Yeah, yeah. and self-interest not being um, fantastic, and why capitalism continuously has to be sort of band-aid plastered by regulation after regulation mm. after mm. regulation. Um, and then, but then the government is lobbyable, and so that doesn't work. But that's exactly it, right? So if you're if you're a restaurant, it's in your self interest to work dis or get your workers to work, despite the fact that they are ill. So the government comes along, and goes, "We've created this regulation," but because they don't properly enforce that regulation, people do it anyway. And then, because their self interest is to keep their workers working to make more money, but then it's not in the self interest of everybody else. Because if you're one worker and you get like ten people ill, that's going to be bad for the economy because those people might then take sick days or they might get somebody else ill or they might not be able to do their work as efficiently as possible. So the economy is actually suffering. It's just in such a indirect, immeasurable way. And that's a, that's a great example of where self, like applying self-interest for one person actually isn't always compatible with the the, the common good, yeah. like yeah. wider self-interest. And I think to add to what you've said there, you know, um, one person who might be ill might have to, might feel they need to go into work because they if they've got a zero hour contract mm. or whatever they don't get sick pay right oh well, I need to go in I zero hour contracts are awful oh yeah horrible right I mean and you know I mean like if you if you're like oh well I need to go in because I need this money because otherwise I'm not going to be able to afford my rent or I'm not going to be able to afford food or you know any other basic necessity you are then incentivized to go in and get more people sick and you're saying there Luke about it being sort of in a sort of more nebulous indirect immeasurable ways. I think as well, we tend to measure things or view things purely through the lens of sort of um, profit, of money, capital, whatever sort of phrase or concept you're, you want to look at, right? But th the idea is that if it doesn't, if it's not about money, if there's no like value there uh, that can be uh, described using numbers and a currency, then it doesn't matter. But or that, that is my point: is that it actually is measurable. Yeah. Like because it it is affecting the 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 sort of GDP of the country. Because if other if you go to a restaurant and ten people get sick because of one one person who couldn't afford to stay home mm. or because forced to come in by their work, well, even though that's illegal, that's ten people who might then be off sick. That's ten people ten people's worth of potentially measure, measurable GDP. It's just that we either we don't have the uh, we don't have the wisdom to sort of go right we might not be able to measure it, but it definitely happens. Yeah. Mm. We see it in schools as well. Like the, the, When yeah. I was at school, I won a lot of awards. Um, but you know, in um, <laughs> one award never won was 100% attendance award because whenever me and my brother were ill, my mother would keep us home because yeah. she was like, because obviously they, my parents could afford to do that. But mm. also it's like, well, it's going to affect the education of other kids in the school. And if my child goes in ill, and then infects like loads of other kids as well. Then they become ill, and it just affects yeah. everyone. Yeah, story. what a weird award. I know. Do you as know if there felt? are kids who just don't ever get ill. Well, Not even that. It was just like they were sent in. Obviously, like people's circumstances were different. But like, I always remember like sitting in the church because I went to a church school, and like there'd be like me and like some maybe some other kids as well, and just look across to my brother like <sighs> seventh year in a row now. <laughs> you know, like you gotta remember though as well. Like that's the interesting thing there, right? You'd be like, well, why do those exist? There are kids who you know need incentives to go. To school and also trying to like incentivizing people to be in school every day. There's a reason that it's like mandated that kids have to go to school up until a certain point. It's because otherwise, parents wouldn't have some parents wouldn't have them in school. They'd have them working um, because they have to, not because they're terrible people. Uh, maybe they're terrible people. I don't know. I'm not making a judgment on that. Uh, but you know, some kids <laughs> might need to be working. So they might, you know, they yearn for the mines. Some kids wouldn't want to go to school. Some kids, you know, would have such an unsupervised home life that like kids don't really want to go to school. 
So if they are able to avoid it, they probably would, right? There are genuine reasons for um, sort of uh, incentivizing people to attend school. 100% attendance, yeah. terrible way of doing that. But yeah. like, you can understand, like, the, the thing is that there's all these, and it kind of ties into the larger conversation, there's all these different sort of motivations um, and yeah, incentives that we need to kind of make a line. But I think what we're missing is that it's not necessarily an issue of no one being able to agree. Um, there, that is an issue. But the, the the greater issue is that we've kind of driven everyone towards this one thing that doesn't actually work in yeah. making people work together, right? Like, I feel like this idea of locking away um, basic necessities like housing, food, um, energy, all of these, locking them away behind um, some arbitrary monetary value, right? You, you then, then having to work to meet that in order to have those things, you're then incentivizing people to just like, do bad stuff or to, you know, like harm each other because it's, it's now survival. It's not like, oh, we actually all have, you know, enough resources to keep on going. Um, we can all just kind of like chill where we want and like do stuff that gives us like value and like work because we need to and like we all support each other, blah, blah, blah. All of that stuff that you actually see people genuinely doing, you know, for example, like literally just in this business uh, that Luke and I have, no one is asking us to do this. We weren't making money from it for a while. We just kind of did it because we because we liked it and yep. it was fun. Yeah. Um, and that that sort of shit works out, right? But, um, you know, when it comes to, well, actually, um, one of you is going to maybe die. Um, and the only way to avoid that is by winning as much as possible. You know, like you're going to if you're turning everyone into contestants that are fighting against each other you're going to see people not like you're, you're going to see people being individualistic but isn't you know that I mean? the whole thing with, like the premise of like Squid Game for example I don't know if you've seen this but the uh, the person who won it mm. um, like the Netflix you know they they, commit, they get the they get the series like the, the one that was actually produced in, in, in South Korea um, and they uh, release it everyone loves it it's it's great um it's a very harsh criticism of, of capitalism and the system that we sort of exist in and then netflix go i oh, know what we could do this let's make it a real game show <laughs> let's make this a real game show yeah. and like you know what we're That's probably about insane. 10 years away from like the hunger games becoming say, a real yeah, thing yeah. we should do the hunger games yeah. Yeah, yeah, might as well. Why we'll not? Put, put loads of yeah. yeah I, we'll talk about. That. I feel like it's a very British thing. I feel like the Hunger Games would be more British. I can't see America actually doing it. I feel like because with Britain we had the empire and everything, and if it was like if the former colonies like rose up, yeah. that the British Empire would be like, yeah, fuck it, we're putting all your kids in an arena and I, making see, you I, fight. I feel like if Britain did it, it wouldn't be so much uh, fascism the way that you know they did it in in the Hunger Games. It would be more like, oh well, I disagree with it, but you know, I kind of like Boris and. It's not as bad when you yeah. kind of look at it, and we, we would all just kind of ignore it, I yeah, feel, so like, I got if it ten, actually happened. So I've got a tenfold acro on District 8 winning, so, you know, I'm, <laughs> gonna, I'm, I'm coming through. But, um, no, coming with the whole point with um, with uh, the Squid, Squid Game thing, the reason I mention it is because the person who won it still has not received their prize money, despite the series. No way. Fin yeah, no. So the, the series, like, wrapped up filming in February this year, and she still hasn't received her prize money. And she's owed about, I think, 4.7 million, wow. something like that. And Netflix haven't, haven't paid her. I refuse and, to watch it, man. Honestly, yeah, no, neither. Just... I don't. I mean, I watched the series Squid Games. So I thought it was good, um, but I wouldn't. I don't want to indulge watching like like the actual like real version of it, like the sort of the reality yeah, version. Because for wrong. a lot of people, it's like people trying to pay off debts, uh, just trying to live, yeah. and they, they see that where, that uh, sort of that humiliation, if you will. You know, like you think some of the challenges within that thing, like the whole thing with like the what was it like you had to carve out like a square or yeah, you had to yeah, 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 like, carve out the shape. And there's the footage of one of uh, one of these guys doing it, and he breaks down. And you think, well, of course, because, you know, that's someone he's paying off a debt or something like that. Yeah. And that's sort of the, the life that we sort of, that we sort of lead inadvertently. And I'm like, what, 40, 50 grand in debt because of uni? Mm -hmm. I'm never paying that off. Well, I, I say that. I mean, HMRC probably will make me do that at some point. But, you know. <laughs> Wait the we'll 30 see. years. Get it written off. I do just want to clarify quickly because we will get comments from economics people that... Um, the, the way that our financial system works is not a zero-sum game. So we're not just fighting each other to take money off each other. The idea is that you also, in the process of competing, you grow the economy. Uh, so you're not just like, if I get a pound, someone else gets one pound less. But I love the way yeah. you put the, <laughs> just, like, just like that. Actually, I think you're fine. <laughs> no, well, just because I don't want I yeah, don't course, want people yeah. to um, spot one factual error that we mm. make, and then because of that, disregard everything we say. No, I agree with you. I, I think I think the interesting thing there about it being a factual error is that functionally it isn't, though. Do you know what I mean? Right, like functionally, um, you know, someone lo someone losing out on a job or someone getting fired and replaced with someone who's cheaper or any of these things, right? Um, okay, it may grow, it may grow the pie. It may make everyone better off in the long run. That doesn't work out if wages don't match 
yeah. um, the increase in, you know, like basically wealth, right? Um, global wealth. If wages don't match that, if um, living standards don't rise to match that, if the poverty line basically stays where it is and more people start to drop below it or, you know, the the amount of money you need to make before you're like functionally in poverty starts to increase and increase and increase. Well, there right? have been like, two reports that have come out recently or last sort of year or so that's found, I think it was the OBR, they found that we currently have the lowest living standards, uh, ONS, I think, we have the lowest living standards on record since they began in the 1950s in this country. Jesus. And there's other reports that suggest that we are, that they, the term we are slipping into, I would say that it's just managed to climb, that we are slipping into Victorian levels of inequality in this country. And that is insane. You yeah. think we, we have, what, the seventh biggest economy in the world? And we are seeing, I think there's 4.2 million children in this country living in poverty. And mm. I used to term, not living is the wrong term to use, surviving, we'll, we'll say. That's one in three children. One yeah. in three children in this country live in poverty. It's honestly, it's despicable. It's disgusting. Uh, but it's the best thing we have, apparently. Well, it's like Winston Churchill said about democracy. You know, democracy is not that great. But, you know, when you look at all the other systems, it doesn't, it suddenly doesn't look that bad. I'm paraphrasing. But that's yeah. in the gist of what he said. Democracy has its problems. But um, ultimately, uh, I think a lot of the problems with democracy, the, the, the democracies that we have now, is that they're not really, they're not really fair because of a lot of the things around them. One of them being capitalism. Yeah. Like the fact that you're able to, like, if you have enough money, you're able to influence any and everything, including government, that's kind of a problem. Well, you look with our democracy, it is basically owned by sort of the Rupert Murdoch's uh, Rovermeers of the world. Mm. And, you know, so Keir Starmer at the moment, sort of the leader of the Labour Party, he has to basically praise Thatcher and see her as this agent of change. Now, she did cause a lot of change, but it was a lot of bad change. And the reason that, you know, people like Starmer have to pander uh, sort of make those comments is because they basically have to grovel to uh, the media class in this country. Yeah. Basically say, like, please support me. I think Thatcher was all right. She was great. Girl power, girl boss. And, you know, they have to do that um, when really it's like, no, 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 we can we can say that she was awful. Yeah. And that she created an underclass and that she stripped communities of their identity uh, to serve a political purpose. She created like the North South divide as we know it. Thatcher created that. The housing crisis created that. The shit in our rivers and our and our oceans created by the privatization of water in this mm. country. And, you know, the railways as well. You know, privatization, the big neoliberal idea, which was this fringe ideology in the 1940s, and by 1979 was governing both the US and the UK. ding a -ling, ling is that the ad bell? I thought it was my tinnitus, but it turns out it's the ad bell. What is he ringing for this week, Luke? Well, today the show is being sponsored and supported, as always, actually, by our Patreon. What? A Patreon? Is that where people can go and pay for trees on something? That is not what it is. Maybe we'll do that as a perk one day. But for now, the Patreon is a place where people can go, people who love this show, like you, for example, can go and support the show existing. It's very complicated and expensive to make this show. And our patrons help it to exist. So we think you are very lovely for doing that. Yeah, if you've ever noticed anyone's name scrolling through at the end of a Sci Guys episode, that's because they're our patrons, and we want to thank our patrons for helping us make this show. So to do that, we give them a whole bunch of things, perks like bonus episodes and a different show, and and other things. What else do we give them, Luke? They get to submit topic ideas for the show for Cory to consider, and then also those topic ideas go into a vote that is voted on every month by our patrons only. So they basically get to control us once a month. So if you really love Sci Guys, and you're not content with just sitting back and watching us natter on, you want to have a hand in the show, you want to be a part of it, go ahead and sign up to our Patreon, because you can be a part of this show. Shall we get on with that show? We shall. So now why don't we talk a little bit about how capitalism affects and interacts with science. Do either of you know anything about the sort of peer review crisis we've got going on, or about open access and all of the controversy surrounding either of those? No. Tell no? me more, please. Well, good. I can tell you. <laughs> right. So do you guys know how peer review works or what peer yeah. review is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, anyone want to give me a, a quick definition? So let's say you write an academic paper. You then send that academic paper off to another sort of academic to review it and then to say, right, well, yes, this is what I think. It's basically like, you know, like at school when you like marked each other's work. Mm. That's basically like the best way of summarizing it. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, peer review is basically that, right? You, If you want something to be published in a journal, uh, usually you've got to have pre-published peer reviews. Uh, there's this idea of kind of having post-published peer reviews. So if something gets published and then it's peer-reviewed um, and there are obvious problems with that right I mean once something is out in in public it's hard to pull it back retract it um, and if there are any issues then you're not safeguarding against those so uh, peer-reviewing before something is published can be really uh, can is probably 
the better of the two. The issue there is um, incentivizing people to do peer reviews, right? Because journals make money. They make a ton of money. Um, if you want to access a lot of the papers uh, that we even uh, use on this podcast, you will need to pay money or be a part of an institution that is paying a lot of money for your access. I mean, these things can be over a hundred quid uh, to just access one single uh, paper. I remember at uni writing papers and you're like, you find some great paper, you see the headline, this is perfect. You got paid 9 99 a month <laughs> and you're like, fuck off. So yeah, I mean, you could be spending a lot of money for a, a single paper, essentially, right? You know, and the issue there is that one, it's paywalled, right? So now um, not everyone can access this thing. People are limited by uh, money just to understand things, right? Even if you don't have the means to uh, perform experiments yourself, if you want to just be in the know, you can't do that unless you have money to do so, or unless you're part of an institution that has money to do so. And so necessarily there's kind of uh, an inequality inbuilt there. Um, and there is a lack of efficiency, right? I mean, if you talk about uh, this argument that people have, this absolute brain dead argument people have against abortion, right? How many uh, future doctors are you aborting when you abort a child or a, a fetus or whatever, right? I don't know. Let's, let's find out. Let's, well, yeah, but like, okay, let's ignore that for a second. A study um, into how many future doctors you are aborting when you, it, it exponentially keeps increasing. Yeah. With but the arguments against safe abortion are always fucking ludicrous. Oh, it's absolutely. Like you, you only, you're like, it's funny, you care about that, that child when it's inside the womb, but the second it's out, you're like, nah, f*** off. And then if that child turns out to be gay, ugh. Yeah, no. No, I mean, it's, it's. Like, I mean, to move away from abortion again, right? <laughs> the, the That argument is used a lot, but in this case, it actually does, it does make a lot more sense. It's a much more sort of, it's, it's a realistic argument there, wherein there are people who otherwise would be able to access this information that cannot because it is behind a paywall. And some, yeah, some journals, um, you know, uh, sort of fund, uh, sort of non-profit uh, things for uh, the common good, you know, in, in regards to science. Others are just for profit, right? And having having access to scientific information be restricted is a problem. And it's a further problem when that money isn't necessarily going to peer review, right? Because there's this sort of thing where people aren't necessarily paid to peer review um, in a lot of cases. Some people will say, oh, well, you know, you want them to remain unbiased. And if they're getting money for it, then blah, 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 blah. But <laughs> it's a broken system, right? What You've... are the blah, 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 blah reasons? Oh, God. I don't want to get into them. Like, <laughs> seriously, I mean, like, if someone's being, if someone's being paid uh, to uh, peer review something, right, the idea is that that um, that incentive could lead to a bias, right? right. If you want to okay. get through as many as possible, yeah. um, then you'll put in less effort. Right. Uh, you'll all of these sorts of things. I mean, ultimately, some of the arguments hold water, but when we're in a situation where the alternative is scientists who are already underpaid, because you got to remember, right? Like people think of scientists as being really well-off folk. A lot of them. RN, a lot of them are working in, in labs and working, um, you know, uh, if they're working in academia, it's the money there is not uh, as good as you'd expect. It's actually oh, it's a, it's really, atrocious. really bad, right? I mean, I think, uh, what is it, for uh, postdocs, uh, you know, if you want to take on a postdoc, you, if you want to take one on from another country, uh, because of the, the the change or proposed change, I have no idea when this episode is coming out, um, uh, you know, because the change in sort of guidelines, laws, whatever, right? You could not have a postdoc come in from another country no. um, because they would not meet the minimum salary requirements uh, to basically come into the country. Right? Yeah, the minimum salary requirement that's being proposed is 38.7 grand a year, which is ludicrous when you consider that the av the average median wage in this country is £29,000 a year. Yeah. So unless they're going to rise everyone's uh, salary to 38 grand a year minimum, uh, yeah, it's a bit it's a bit ludicrous to be bringing in those those sort of things. It's ridiculous, and you know, with with regards to the sort of peer review crisis and open access, right? You could say the problem isn't to do with capitalism, but I think fundamentally, um, it is being built up. Uh, by 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 this right because uh, let's say you have a system wherein uh, you don't need to work just to meet the minimum sort of uh, bar uh, barrier for survival right uh, people could devote more time to things that aren't really you know sort of profitable and peer review isn't all that profitable right it, it's not all that profitable um in the long run like as you're saying luke yes it can be um and it probably is because uh you know a lot of money goes into a lot of things like drug development or um you know development of basically a shitload of products right of and there is uh you can invest a lot of time into something 
and get nothing from it, sort of financially speaking, right? Um, invest a lot of time into uh, a vaccine or a new kind of medication or um, a new fuel, any of these things. There's a long production process, especially if it's going to be used by people. And sometimes you just lose a lot of money there. Um, and so, yeah, the incentive to have sort of better peer review so that we can, we have sort of replicable um, studies that are coming out as opposed to ones that are kind of, you know, a little bit uh, stitched together and eh, not really not really as, as true or correct as they could be, right? There is an incentive there to, um, you know, for companies to be more rigorous with that, but it's obviously not enough, right? It's very clearly not enough. And we've got a situation right now wherein scientists aren't really being paid enough. Uh, the idea of peer review is kind of not exactly falling apart, but it's not up to the standard that it should be because it is not profitable. And when things are not profitable in this system, unless there is uh, specific efforts from, you know, the government, uh, you're not going to have those things work or continue existing or be as uh, efficient or, you know, useful as they could as they could otherwise be. I have a capitalism economics exercise for you. I would like you to construct me a um, self-interested model as to why a scientist might peer review a paper or a piece of research um, that doesn't have any immediate um, sort of economic uh, benefit for their company. <laughs> you gagged me. <laughs> because, and the reason is, is because so much of science, so many of the things we, we breakthroughs in science aren't immediately obvious why they were, why they were so important. And so that's why science is partly why science mm. is so important. Doing a lot of science in, in lots of different ways is so important because we don't actually know which ones are going to be fruitful. Um, and so you do need peer review um, across the board. So now, how could a self-interested capitalist in individual in a capitalist system um, be motivated through self-interest alone uh, to peer review a paper if there's no money on, on offer? Well, I guess if it matches similar research to what they're doing, I guess it makes sense to, for, for them to sort of promote it. Yeah, but also yeah, it doesn't yeah, because, it doesn't because uh, <laughs> scientists can be really like self-centered. And well, if they're doing this work, uh, not all of them. I mean, yeah. a lot of scientists are very much and like, don't get me wrong, there are plenty who are like, someone else is doing similar work. Yes. But if you've got someone you're racing each other to. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes because sense. Because yeah. you're, you're being set to compete against each other. Luke, you guys are like, yeah, it's very intense. It's, what, a, do it's a dog eats dog world of science. I, mate, I owe you guys an apology. I weren't familiar with the game. I wasn't familiar with <laughs> mate, honest, that's why, that's why I'm, that's why I'm doing a podcast. Okay. But that's <laughs> way less competition over here. But um, Luke, I, I seem to recall you um, sort of mentioning something like this before. Before, so stop me if I'm if I'm <laughs> stepping on your toes here. But I think what you proposed was something to the effect of like a pool um, of money, wherein um, anyone that sort of uh, works in that field or contributes to that field in a particular way, because obviously you want your peer reviews to remain um, anonymous, otherwise. You know, you could be, uh, they could be sort of uh, messed with, muddled with in some way there. Um, everyone is entered into sort of pools so that when there are breakthroughs or someone were to win a Nobel Prize or if there's any kind of money coming back in, that it then gets filtered down to everyone who had a finger in the pie. Yeah. I but also <laughs> that wouldn't work because can you... Like, can you imagine the scale of okay? Uh, we've got uh, we've got this new vaccine, and it's making money because it's, for some reason uh, this 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 medicine, this life saving medicine, is making a profit. Um, let's share this profit amongst everyone in uh, the biochemical engineering <laughs> fields. The medic, like it just, I I don't think there is a way to you know this mo to build this sort of model of self interest wherein a science because in inherently so much of science is selfless. Um, to an extent, in that it's driven by people who just are interested in stuff. Like, there are people, there are scientists who have devoted their entire lives to studying something that is like a worm at the bottom of the ocean, and, you know, it doesn't, like, it's not going to change the world. It might, but they don't think that it's necessarily going to change the world. They're just damn interested in that worm, right? And they will spend their entire lives doing that. And I, I feel like science is a field more than more than others, wherein it is... It is often populated by people who just just really like doing the thing. And that's why, you know, if you look back through history, the only scientists you saw were the people with the means. And they were just like kind of not fucking about, but kind of just fucking about. Right. Like Isaac Newton. Right. He's just like, man, I'm Which smart. version of Isaac Newton are we talking about? The Which brown one from Doctor Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, but seriously, I mean, it was like a lot of science before was just rich people doing stuff because they had the means to. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think that ultimately, 
if we if we removed this sort of threat of you know starvation or homelessness or um, restriction of basic necessities, you'd probably see a lot more scientists because it's fun, it's good, and it is rewarding in and of itself. Well, you this know? is the whole thing with like Rishi Sunak. He said in a talk with Elon Musk that he wants people to be taking more risks. And it's like, but you've created a system where people can't afford to do that. Yeah. You know, for someone like myself, I can afford to take risks with stuff I do on TikTok and other sort of, you know, my podcast, for example. I can afford to take those risks because I'm, you know, I benefit from a system that has enabled me to do that. If I, you know, if I survived on my sort of basic salary at the moment, I wouldn't be able to take those risks. And it's because I have a sort of other sort of like a, a security security blanket if you will mm. in the form of living at home my parents uh that i um i don't have to i don't uh feel that that strain necessarily yeah fair yeah oh absolutely you're so you're so right and Luke, I know. was there any <laughs> was there anything that uh you wanted to add to your question there Luke? no well i was kind of messing with you really because um i mean you could try and build a self-interested model out of that about like oh uh, well maybe uh, you define, you widen the the idea of self interest so greatly that somebody thinks that their interests are aligned with science being moved forward in general in such a distant way that they do the hard work to. I think that could be a self interest. But model. that is it. That, yeah, that's that's what you said. Or <laughs> or the other thing you can do is you can go well the government get some tax money and creates a self-interest by paying people. But ultimately, that's not capitalism because it's ultimately the government has taxed people yeah. and then created a not, like, an, a, a, an arbitrary kind of... Um, like, it's not free markets, ultimately. when Free markets are not... Uh, once they're being regulated, they're no longer free markets, right? Mm. And, and like, at the extreme, at the most like vanilla core, core free markets. Um, so it's kind of a joke, basically, to go, <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Like, there are people all the time... Are acting outside of their 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 self interest. Um, other than widening self interest so broadly to go, you generally think that the human race should carry on existing. It's just a ludicrous exercise to kind of like try and fit everything into that sort of capitalist model. There are things that fall outside of it. Um, however, yes, the thing you were talking about that I mentioned was to do with this sort of weird. Um, keeping track of every contribution everyone had ever made and whenever anyone wins anything it ripples back down I love that as an idea it is ultimately a band-aid to a, to a weird system um, yeah. where where like people are not incentivized to just do stuff for the common good um, but I, I do like it in theory like I, I think it's an interesting idea but then you'd increase the problem of people um, just getting authorship on papers for doing very little for basically having uh, the people working in their labs the sort of grad students and whatnot. Um, doing a bulk of the work for them and then just slapping their their own name um, on the paper yeah. because it's their lab. But isn't that just like capitalism 101? Yeah. Where basically yeah, you have yeah. like people doing the donkey work and then you just appear at the end going like, this is my product. It's like Elon Musk probably the best example. <laughs> Elon Musk is a stupid person's idea of what a smart person is in that he is like, he is kind of like seen as the face of like so many of the brands. Like, I mean, like obviously Twitter, which is now renamed X, uh, Tesla. Not on this podcast. Like <laughs> people like with like PayPal and stuff like that. Yeah. He's like literally he, all he does is just comes along sort of just stands there. You ever seen that meme of the guys like cutting the cake and there's the one guy like he doesn't even have a knife but he's got his hand next to it sort of staring at the camera and it's like that, that's Elon Musk right? yeah. and that, that is him to a T and in, to anyone who wants to give me shit about slagging off Elon Musk it's like I, I don't give him oh no no we do that very very often on here I mean he's very much um, he's the kind of guy that comes in makes something worse and then says look how great I am he bought this he bought Twitter for like what 40 billion and it's now valued at 20 billion and that was just rife with well, actually, here's the thing. here's the thing um, Twitter isn't valued at anything. Now, X, X. is... There you go. That's oh, the... He, uh, he yeah, got you. Nah, he's got me checkmate liberal. You know, it's uh, it's amazing. But yeah, I mean, like, ultimately, I, I think the point I want to get across here is that when you look at um, all of these sort of core tenets of uh, science as it is now, you know, um, people being able to access it and um, sort of, you know, like, this sort of peer review to make sure that we check our own work, um, they're, they're kind of acting against capitalism, or rather capitalism is acting against these things because, you know, journals are not incentivized to let people have access to all their stuff because, well, no, 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 wait, people can pay to submit um, and then also people pay to read it. And so we want to get as much money for us as possible because we're a business and that's our one goal, to make as much profit as possible. So obviously we just inflate the cost of the journal. And like, do you know what I mean? There's not really, that element of competition isn't, isn't there in the same sense um, for journals, uh, as as it may exist in other places, because you know, if if you're if you're talking about nature, right? Nature is like one of the journals, right? It is one of the biggest science journals, right? A lot of the stuff um, that like a lot of the stuff that we have in this podcast, there will be stuff from nature, right? 
Now, nature, they are, they don't have a monopoly, but they they have a lot of they have a lot of sway, right? If you get a if you get a study in nature, that's probably going to be seen as um, not necessarily more valid, but it's going to be given more weight than a study showing up in some tiny like you know journal from some other some other country, you know, that okay. no one actually reads, right? There is a weighting to these sorts of things, and there are some high impact journals that will just reject things that aren't sort of high impact enough. They're they're like, oh well, this isn't groundbreaking, and this is kind of like a slow moving field now. And so we're not accepting this. We're only going to accept stuff that's uh, that's big, that's looking for sort of like headlines, and and you know that's going to change things. And all of these sort of all of these sorts of things are just, I think, amped up by this system that we have, wherein people are incentivized to do more, be the best, like gain as much as they can. And ultimately, that's really not what science is about, right? You've got to do so much not even boring stuff, but you've got to do so much stuff that doesn't seem important. You've got to do so much stuff that doesn't, uh, you know, make headlines uh, before you can get to the stuff that does make big changes. And sometimes the stuff that doesn't seem like it's important turns out to be very important, you know, a few years down the line when you've got uh, more information to understand it. And the entire sort of system that we've got, folks, uh, the way that sort of journals work is just not healthy, I think. And a lot of other people think as well. Um, you know, for the continued sort of, uh, f for science as a whole and continuing this mm. sort of thing that we've got where we try things, try them again, have other people check our work, try to be as unbiased as, po as possible and get as close to the truth as one possibly can, you know? Yeah, you've yeah. got an interesting thing where like science is having to, at least to a certain extent, because presumably people who get their studies published in big journals, they might, well, not, not only they're going to be famous or more famous than they were before, um, and then other people will be more likely to want to work with them or they might be, get a more prestigious job or more likely to get a grant from somewhere, all those kind mm. of things. You've got a weird thing where science is sort of, the the in, the um, the uh, sort of incentives of science are sort of intersecting with the incentives of journalism. Mm. And those are like, they're, they're, they're probably not 100% against each other, but like they're definitely not aligned in many places. Yeah. Um, if you've got scientists basically uh, who are trying to advance in their careers, playing by the rules of a kind of what is especially especially now like moved towards more like clickbait, more sensationalism. Mm. That's not definitely not going to be very good for science. No, it's not. You can see that now as well. I mean, it's really it's really changed things. Well, I say it's really changed things. I mean, that's probably something that was present for quite a while. But I feel it's really clickbait stuff has, has led to some studies that are just published where. So you what know, examples of clickbait are there? So uh, what I mean is. Oh, is yeah. It, yeah. So, just yeah, say in uh, mice. <laughs> yeah. So um, you've got studies that are published that um, are looking to be picked up. Um, and the sort of clickbait that you get is, oh, well, we found, uh, God, yeah, we found um, a way to stop death in mice in this really specific situation. I mean, you have something okay. that's like, right. we've we've cured cancer in this one specific mouse, or we've discovered this or this <laughs> yeah. or that. And it's all exciting. And it's like, aliens could be coming down to earth. And it's like, if you look at what scientists have said, they're like, well, no, we just don't really know what this is. Um, it could be, it, 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 could it be aliens? Well, I mean, I, I can't rule out that it's not aliens, but I mean... So it could be aliens! <laughs> yeah. But ultimately, yeah. I, I think that it's probably just um, a smudge on the... Aliens! Yeah, it's like... <laughs> They're you know, coming! I mean, to an extent, that's always existed, but this sort of um, this sort of news cycle that we're in now as well, I mean, you know, it's, it's constant. It is a constant thing. And especially for science communication, um, you know, it's really bloody difficult. Like, I, I see people on TikTok, um, especially now, TikTok is a great thing, and... It's, it's led to a lot of scientists uh, who are working in their fields having a voice, you know, being able to speak to people directly. And that's fantastic. It's also led to people who are more idiots like me that aren't scientists working in their field. that are just kind of um, repeating stuff that they've read and seen and heard and whatnot. Right. And like the issue is when you've got so many of these people, it's really bloody hard to like find who to listen to. Um, and it's so easy to just read an article that was written by someone who doesn't, you know, really, who isn't really sort of in uh, sort of science, that isn't in a specific field, doesn't have the background knowledge. Um, an article that is written by someone uh, like that, that is misrepresenting something that was said in a paper. Um, and then, you know, you go to TikTok and it's someone that's just read that article and they've misrepresented it even more. And so, like, I find that a lot of what I'm doing, you know, is parsing through all of the nonsense that I'm finding and being like, okay, well, what is the actual story here? Oh, it's boring. And of course it's boring because so many stories are boring and that's yeah. good, right? Like, science stories being boring just means, like, you know, we're, we, we can't have groundbreaking, like, giant steps. 
all the time. I script all my videos, and there were times where I started doing a script. Uh, I'm covering a story, and I think, oh, this is really important. And I get to the point where, like, first of all, do, will people actually care about this? Second of all, do I care about this? And thirdly, like, you know, am I actually representing this properly? And mm. you and sometimes go, you know what? We'll, we'll shelve it. We'll talk about it later. Having integrity when it comes to producing sort of factual or educational or science communication or any of these sorts of, like, um, sort of, I would say, really important sort of um, types of content out there. I'm not saying that what we do is really important. Um, and so for some people it is, but, uh, you know, these really important things where facts are imperative, having integrity in those in those sort of uh, fields makes it much more difficult to perform well on social mm. media. And, you know, science communication, I get how people will be coming into this and being like, you guys are talking about um, your silly podcast where you talk about science. We've had people, you know, uh, say, hey, I'm studying marine biology because of you. Hey, um, you gave me an interest in science again, and so now I'm doing this. We've got people that are doctors, uh, people that are working on their PhDs, but, but all of these sorts of different people listening, right? Yes. Um, and another thing that we get a lot is people being like, oh, well, you've given me an interest in learning again. I feel like we shouldn't ignore, uh, you know, the fact that people understanding this stuff is very fucking important, right? People having some idea of what is going on is important. And, you know, when you when you incentivize certain things, um, like getting content out fast, having snappy um, uh, sort of headlines or, you know, clickbaity titles and whatnot, or thumbnails that just seem like they're super clickable. And, you know, you've got to misrepresent things in a lot of cases if you want to do that consistently. And when you start misrepresenting things, or if you start sort of, you know, not giving the whole truth or like talking about stuff that you don't really understand or, you know, being like, this is exactly what it is and being definitive because being definitive is a, a lot more engaging than someone uh, than someone being like, oh, well, we don't really know. We're not really sure. You know, all of that sort of stuff. It, it incentivizes, even on that level, um, a sort of lack of honesty and integrity um, and a sort of deviation from fact. And that is a problem. And so you could see that it... it, it almost every level, right? That capitalism has got its little roots into science and made it more difficult to be what it is. It is good to see. And I think that's the thing. You want to generate interest. You want to get people uh, involved and you want people to feel like they actually matter. Mm. And I feel like with science and politics, there is that sort of thing there. You know, you want people to feel like no matter how niche or small they may feel, that they have a role to play and mm. that they should uh, do uh, sort of take on that role as best as they can and do it to the best of their ability. I totally agree. Yeah. And I want to be clear <laughs> that I'm not saying you can't be successful or do really well in these sorts of fields, um, you know, without sort of having uh, a lack of integrity. Uh, I just, I'm just saying that in a lot of cases, you can get, you can get a lot of traction a lot quicker if you just kind of throw some morals out the window. And there are plenty of people who are terribly terribly good at this that haven't done that right you know hank green for example is just you know the greens they've been doing good stuff for it's pretty much as i mean as long as a lot of people who are watching will have been on the internet um and there are plenty more people um as well obviously like tom scott blah 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 we could i could put a list in the comments or something there's plenty of people a lot of it just is love. timing though but yeah and it, it, the thing is there's luck there's timing there's all of all of these sorts of things but i think it's it would be sort of uh silly to miss out the fact that um you are often incentivized to be less than sort of accurate and more sensational i mean we've we've done an episode on the talking dogs of tiktok you know with bunny who uses the bloody presses the buttons and the dog can talk and we did that episode and we were very honest and we said this is nonsense this is nonsense. <laughs> that was the Wait, worst what, what response. Was uh, so there's dogs on TikTok and they press buttons on a soundboard uh, and people say that the dogs are able to communicate and talk. Like you're like, um, what <coughs> now, <coughs> please? Yeah. Like, oh, right. Okay. Me, oh, one, ouch. half. And like, I understand why it's engaging and I understand why lots of people like the idea, but that was, I think, the most negative response to any episode we've ever had. <laughs> and we've done some very controversial episodes. Yeah. And the one that people like really hated the most was when we said, hey, look, sorry, guys, but speaking from a sort of scientific perspective, these dogs can't talk. They won't be able to talk. <laughs> do you think it's because you ruined their fun? Well, that's, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Like, and do you know what I mean? And sometimes you have they to ruin believe, their fun. Yeah. Sometimes you have to ruin fun. It is not fun to be the one that ruins oh. fun, but... ding -ling -ling, is that the ad bell? I think it is, but it's... It's rather quiet this time. Well, Luke, we want to keep a big old secret about this Psy Guys merch. Yes, 
Please do not tell anybody and do not purchase any of it. Otherwise, people will find out. They might see you wearing our merch or displaying our merch and think, oh, wow, what a cool person. And I'll tell you this, as a cool person myself, having people think you're a cool person can be very, very stressful. Yeah, we can't have that. We also can't have you supporting the show to exist that you're enjoying right now. Yeah, so absolutely under no circumstances should you go to normalcitizen.store and pick up some Psy Guys merch. Some Psy Guys merch like beanies and posters and t-shirts and calendars and cool stuff like that. Definitely don't go to that store and buy that. Goodness me, that's an awful lot of stuff that I'm not going to purchase. Absolutely, Luke. Now let's get back to the show before anyone listens to us. God, I really hope we got away with that one. So we've spoken about a lot of different things to do with capitalism. I want to talk about a study that um, I read, uh, just one specific study, about uh, capitalism and the brain. So this one is testing hypotheses around the harm that capitalism causes to the mind and brain, a theoretical framework for neuroscience research. This is from 2023, and it's also in Frontiers in Sociology. Um, They bring up a bunch of different things. It's quite an interesting paper to read. But uh, it essentially looks at capitalism um, as a system and how it affects you know, the brain, people's mental health, all of these sorts of things. And it actually breaks it down in and, and sort of looks at it and says, hey, all of these things that, you know, we talk about mental health issues and, and all of that. Why don't we talk about the root cause of a lot of them, which is the constant distress and constant stress mm. that people are in uh, due to this system. Um, and it calls for, you know, at the end, it sort of calls for, uh, more research on how these things sort of interact um, and more research on how this system affects people's uh, minds, uh, how these sort of um, ideas uh, don't really match up with reality, right? The models that you're talking about, how they don't really fit in with how people would genuinely actually act. Um, and yeah, no, I really enjoyed reading this paper. I'll, I'll give you guys a little bit more on it in a sec, but um, you got anything to say? I mean, I think with mental health issues in this country, obviously it's increased. And I think that that's part of two reasons. One, I think we, we're acknowledging it more that the stigma is being broken. Um, but then I feel like it's also becoming a bit of a meme at the same time. We can look at that later, particularly like men's mental health, for example. Mm. Um, but also with with this government for example, you think like CAMS, which I don't know if you've ever had to use that service. I wouldn't wish mm-hmm. that service upon uh, anyone because it's not that it's a, a ne- bad service necessarily because of the people that run it. Well, yeah, it is because of the people that run it because there's no funding going into it. Mm. You know, the, um, you know, increase in people being diagnosed with anxiety. I mean, I've suffered with anxiety and, and depression, and the only reason I'm actually able to say that I kind of recovered from it was because uh, my family had the means to help get me the support that I would have needed. You look at the waiting list; it's like what two years, something. Like like that oh, some yeah. people don't have two some people don't even have two days yeah and I, I think again this is what i find funny about you know your the corporate you know your, your metas of the world who are trying who do sort of campaigns regarding mental health and it's like you're part of the reason people's mental health is so bad and yeah. you've basically created this economy uh of likes clicks comments and um it's driving people to depression and anxiety uh, but, you know, Mental Health Awareness Month and all that. Yeah, no, you're so right. And I mean, this paper goes into a lot of different reasons, uh, a lot of different sort of ways that capitalism can cause mental health issues. Um, one of them that they bring up, I think the first one they bring up is inequality, which is, as we've kind of touched on, a fundamental aspect of capitalism. Like, you cannot have um, capitalism exist um, in any in any way where it could be meaningfully described as capitalism and not have some degree of inequality. Otherwise, where is the incentive for, you know, those those little Asian kids to be building all our phones and whatnot, right? They just doing out of the goodness of their hearts? I think not. I think it's because of the inequality, right? Um, a lot of it's, there's, 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 a, there's a great system where basically they trap people, um, where sort of factories, for example, will trap whole families, whole generations of people uh, into uh, basically enslavement, really. And what they'll do is they'll say, um, I tell you what, you come work for me and I'll fund like, uh, let's say I'll, like, I'll fund fund your rent or something mm-hmm. like that. They'll pay that. Um, but then what happens is basically that person is then trapped in a contract with very, that is very difficult to get out of. So they basically work for that person effectively for free. And then, then their children will then take mm-hmm. over and then their children. And it's, uh, it's incredibly sort of common sort of like, the global south, I believe. Yeah, and these are sort of things that are really easy easy for us to overlook um, because, you know, we don't need to engage with it. Another thing, you know, that happens in this country and in a lot of other countries is something we've brought up a lot, which is prisons, right? Prisons, people in prison, um, they will work and they will not be paid remotely anything close to minimum wage for their work. I mean, I think quite literally one or a couple pounds 
an hour. You can go watch our mm-hmm. Science of Prisons episode if you want to know the specifics on that. But, um, you know, uh, in the th- 30 years following 1977, according to this paper, 60% of the increase in U.S. national income went to the just uh, just the top 1% of earners. Um, and this is projected to become even more extreme without tax adjustment, right? So... That um that is literally just a quote from that paper, and what it's talking about there is that all of the sort of wealth, all of this increase in sort of money that is, if we're going to be really simple about it, this increase in wealth that's been generated right over the, over the past few decades hasn't been distributed amongst everyone. Obviously, obviously not. You can literally look at the increase of productivity, and you can look at wages not even remotely matching that. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's not gone to everyone. Um, and it's not like we've got better products out of it. Like yes, um. How, you hate capitalism, but have iPhone? Yes, I have iPhone. Yeah. iPhone doesn't exist because of capitalism. iPhone exists because people make iPhone. People can make iPhone in different systems, but also iPhone exists to break constantly because capitalism, right? You you can't get, if you were to make, you know, an iPhone that were that lasted as long as it possibly could, which they don't, right? You could probably have one lasting like at least half a decade. Oh, yeah, it's imagine, like they announced right? a new one, like, you know, someone's iPhone 10 just starts glitching and they're like, I know what you're doing. Yeah, I exactly. know what you're doing. I can't prove it. Tim but, Cook, I see you. But I know like, what you're doing. You know what I mean? And I, the thing is that things could be better if we weren't tied into this sort of system. For example, right? Like, you know, people, a, a rise in unemployment, right? That could exist, for example, because jobs are being automated and you know, there are fewer jobs. People can't have those jobs anymore. Now you need to be more skilled for different jobs. You need to have more education, all of this sort of stuff. What I'm seeing here is a company was making enough to exist. It had enough money to pay all of its uh, all of its uh, employees. And then what happened is they found a way to decrease um, their costs by paying fewer employees. And what they could have done instead uh, is continue to pay people more or continue paying people, all that sort of stuff, and then add in sort of self-service checkouts as well. Do you know what I mean? Right, there are a way, like what, what we're seeing here is um, the sort of money that's being made is staying the same. They're just spending less on people. And that obviously shows you there is there are more than enough resources to go around. There are many ways to yeah. see that there are more than enough well, resources course. to go around. But the fact that like, you know. Well, when you look at like the deindustrialization of, of the <coughs> North in particular, or of, uh, of industry in this country, particularly in like the, the 70s and obviously in the 80s, um, what was happening, so you like, say like coal mining, for example, mm. it's not sustainable. We we probably shouldn't we shouldn't be doing it in this country. I don't know. It's and been last. Like, yeah, it's been it's gone this long. It is, and, and people basically and basically what they found was well we can just outsource it. Mm. So we can just import it, and then basically okay. So we no longer need these. Uh, we no longer need these jobs in this country. We're just going to take them away. We're going to close. We're going to close the pits now. The problem was is that they were closing the pits, but not offering the people who have been working in those sectors any alternative to retrain or mm. a new job entirely. So basically you just take away the jobs and not only when you take away the job, you're then taking away that person's livelihood. You're destroying the local economy. You're then causing mental health issues. Mental health issues amongst young men in particular in those communities rose. And then what rose of that? Unem- uh, unemployment, obviously. Crime. Mm. Uh, substance abuse as well. And the, uh, you find areas of this country, particularly old uh, mining communities. My mother my mother lived in one in, in Nottingham. Um, that, you, that you then find the rise of the National Fronts. You then find loads of other issues. And it's caused because basically you take away people's purpose mm. and when you take away people's purpose they don't know what to do yeah and i think that's that's there's so many key points in there right i mean the idea that if you sort of remove jobs and don't give an alternative um things are going to get worse uh, sort of addiction is actually something else that's brought up in this paper because it's such uh, a thing that is tied to modern capitalism right um and i, I think again again right the fact that we have all of these resources and that it is we are more productive we can produce these resources for less that means that the money is going somewhere and it's not to the people that were otherwise producing those resources and that is that i think is the problem right that people don't understand that we don't need to work we, uh, like we don't need to work as much as we do that like we we are we are producing things at an insane scale a scale that we don't need to be producing things at like realistically um and we're able to do so many things um you know with technology now that we weren't able to do 10 20 30 50 100 years ago and yet we're all still living roughly you know in the same sort of way right yes there's more sort of convenience with i can go down to the shop and i can get fruit that isn't in season or i can have food delivered directly to my door where i might not have been able to before right all of these things that aren't necessary. You then have advertising sort of telling you, you need these things, you can't be happy without this. And all of this is just to keep the system running. And it clearly has an effect on um, sort of mental health. I mean, as this paper uh, goes into, right? I mean, 
sort of workplace relations it talks about as well. So the idea of competition within the workplace, you don't see your colleagues necessarily as a team if you're constantly vying for, oh, well, I want to get that promotion. I need to move up um, ahead of that. There are there are necessarily fewer roles higher up than there are lower down. And so you are competing against everyone that you're working with, right? That has um, that has an effect on mental health just there. Um, within your community as well, right? Um, communities are like a very easy thing to get rid of, right? Uh, you should be able to, I think, get everything you need within a sort of 15 minute walk from your house, right? Now that's communism. Yeah. <laughs> and it's bloody good then. No, but seriously, right? Like, and that, if you think about um, spaces, like public spaces, uh, in America, there aren't, it, like, in some places, there aren't a lot of public spaces. Like, if you go, walk around LA, you're going to be hard pressed to find a place yeah. that you can just sit and not pay money to be in. Um, and here we've got a better, a bit of a better situation where there are more parks and whatnot. But basically, because communities aren't directly profitable, right? Investing yeah. in uh, just places for people to just, be and not have to pay and just chill and do stuff, right? Because that's not profitable, there's less investment in that. And necessarily, these social animals um, are going to be worse off. Social animals being humans, us, we're going to be worse off, you know? But then it's interesting you mentioned the whole idea of, of profit and sort of linking that to sort of 15 minute cities, for example, which has obviously become like a big focus here in the UK. We'll obviously, mm. like look at Oxford, for example. Um, and you think, well, actually, there, there is kind of profit to be made. If you've got people using public transport, if you've got people cycling, you've got people mm. around, they're going to be, they're going to have to buy bikes, they're going to be walking around, they're going to be spend. they are going to be spending more. It's just because, you know, you can't drive into the city centre somehow, that's a bad thing. Mm. And also for like a lot of the objection to 15 minute cities is based in, is heavily based in conspiracy and a lot of it links to like lockdown conspiracies because yeah. people remember what it was like in lockdown it's fucking awful getting like basically like not being able to move mm. and they basically you know you're Katie Hopkins of the world who sort of parrot a lot of these conspiracy theories uh, surrounding uh, 15 minute cities um, use that angst that people have about that that fear of being locked down again and that they use that to their advantage it's the same with like any sort of like a uh, sort of scapegoat if you will but mm. then you know you find a lot of cities like london for example is a 15 minute city mm. and a 50 when people a 15 minute city can is basically defined as having like you know your basic needs uh within 15 minutes vicinity either walking distance or cycling um which is not a bad thing you know it's very convenient <laughs> You know, like, uh, but like many uh, people did, uh, yeah. used to live in a village and never leave the village in yeah. their entire you, you life. Would, you that would was a fifteen minute. Of, life. You think the type of people in like Facebook groups where it's like, uh, you know, oh, like picturesque English. Oh, that was great when Britain was British. You know, hang all the paedophiles. Like, you know, that sort of um, that sort of mentality. Mm. And now they're all suddenly against it because you know, like the woke or something. I don't it's know. It's woke so. now. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no. Good living conditions are woke now. And so, <laughs> basic pay? necessarily, Whoa. we must hate them. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, like, all of these sorts of things that have been destroyed steadily, um, you know, as capitalism has continued um, to just, just go. Just, it's just, it's just done its thing. Um, uh, you know, it, it is, it has had like a noticeable effect on uh, mental health. I mean, discrimination based on beliefs, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, etc. That's um, an intersectional effect that they that they bring up, um, and they, they point out that stig is like sort of stigma. These sort of uh, stigmas are sort of enhanced within capitalism. Like they're incentivized um, further, right? I mean, like even if we look at the most simple sort of thing, if we talk sort of, talk sort of uh, politically, right? It is very profitable to hate trans people because you can say, "Hello, people, you're scared, right? I get that you're scared. Here is a target for you to be scared of." okay, cool, now give me money or, okay, cool, now vote for me and I'll get money from that, you know, like maybe uh, not directly, but indirectly and also directly as well, right? There, it is, it pays to find a group for people to hate, right? There's a reason you can't get Posey Parker off YouTube despite the fact that she's broken the guidelines a countless number of times. There's a reason that Steven Crowder is still making his show. There's a reason that all of these people still exist um, on these spaces. It's because they're profitable, it's profitable to hate people. And like, if there wasn't the incentive for profit, I really genuinely believe that a lot of these people wouldn't rally against this shit nearly as much as they do, because why would you spend your time, you know what I mean, hating yeah. people that that much well, I mean, look unless at, like, there's with, something to gain from it with like migrants for example the treatment you know I'm, I'm, I'm the son of an immigrant and you know I've, I've been very fortunate that mm. I haven't received a lot of the, the abuse that, that sort of come, comes that, uh, come, that can come your way but I think you know you look at uh, sort of the, the Rwanda deal which as, as we speak today is, is potentially going to be voted in and it's not a, a viable it's not a viable solution you know we reportedly have what 25 between 45,000 people making uh, 
crossings via small boats. Rwanda can only take 200 people. So, like, the idea that that's somehow going to be a deterrent, it's like, mm. you look at your odds, you're like, yeah, might as well just do it. Yeah. Um, but we don't, um, it's performative cruelty. And again, with, with, with the treatment of trans people, you know, you had Rishi Sunak in his Tory party conference speech, didn't mention the cost of living once, but found the time to slag off trans people mm. and mm. do it in a way that gets people riled up. It's, you know, the, like, using the term woke, for example, I don't know, like, there seems to be like a certain demographic of people in this country. If you say woke to them, you, they react the same way that a dog reacts to the word walk. Let's like, become like very excited. <laughs> it's a word they don't really understand what it means, but they know that they're going to get something that they can get get excited about. Yeah. And with uh, with with the whole trans stuff, it, it is just it's moral panic, and it is being done because they know that you know it's a mar that marginalized group. What two hundred and sixty thousand people identify as trans in this country. 0.5% of the population mm -hmm. like why like you you don't care about these people and a lot of particularly from the right wing uh with, with this government and, and other governments the, the it always comes from this idea of like wanting to protect women and children okay if you want to care about women the fact that what mm. one in three women a week are killed at the hands of a current or former partner you don't give a shit about that you don't deal with that you've cut funding to women's refuges over the last 13 years you don't give a shit about them you implemented austerity measures which significantly impacted young single women particularly young single mothers who you claim to care about with children as well as, as we said earlier one in three children in this country live in poverty that's 4.2 million children you don't give a shit about children you don't give a shit about women all you care about is attacking a marginalized community why? Because like, it makes money. Because it literally votes as well. Like they get staying longer. Lee Anderson, deputy chairman of the Tory party, said that they will be fighting the next election on culture war issues, yeah. like trans issues. And you see, with like the Daily, uh, the Daily Mail, the Daily Hile, as they should really be called, uh, with the trial of uh, Brianna Guy, they're releasing a podcast about it, like covering it, so trying to sensationalise the murder of a sixteen-year-old trans girl. What the. F you playing at yeah. you don't care about these people you write hit piece upon hit piece about trans people and influence people's uh uh beliefs and thoughts about them and now you're then trying to do this it's like piss off yeah no yeah i i can't really add anything else to that i mean if we can move on to the rest of the of course, paper yeah. the last the last part of that is the selfish brain so we've been talking about self-interest um and all of this sort of stuff throughout the episode and this idea that a healthy person their brain is supposed to be geared towards just being self-interested, right? Is something that is pretty bloody prevalent, right? Um, to the point where if you look at sort of descriptions of autism, it's it's quite funny sometimes, not funny, but quite funny sometimes, where, wherein um, sort of characteristics, traits that are present within, within autism, uh, people want to make them seem bad, right? So uh, th this idea that um, some autistic people can be too empathetic and too <laughs> altruistic. Why are these people so nice? It's like, but they, but it, but it's not that they are so nice. It's that they're they don't even understand. They're so they're so silly, crazy that they're being too nice, whereas <laughs> other people wouldn't be. And it's like we've built up we we've built up this very neurotypical and very specific idea of what health is, um, and a lot of that is around being productive in society. And, you know, capitalism necessarily, um, it necessarily makes us sort of want to categorize these things that make people unproductive and say, this is aberrant, this is, this is a wrong way to be, let's correct this, right? ADHD, for example, it is really hard to be a productive little cog in a capitalist system when you've got ADHD, really bloody hard. And there are all these sort of mechanisms for making people not necessarily happier in themselves or, um, you know, more sort of fulfilled in what they're doing, but just more able to fit in and be normal. And that is present throughout so much. Oh, you see um, with autism. Sort of, yeah. You see with autism. I mean, I'm autistic myself. I'm fairly high functioning. I only got diagnosed about 14, which is really late for a boy. And, you know, there is the whole like masking thing. Mm. And, you know, I found when I, you know, working in various professions that I've had over the years, it's like I've been able to keep it to myself and the reason that I keep it to myself he says talking about it on a podcast <laughs> um, is that um, you know it, it, it you people have those conceptions they have those beliefs and one of them like hearing what you said about like being too overly nice the one I've always heard is like you know we can't we can't process emotion that you know we're very sort of like neutral and we don't mm. really um, sort of acknowledge stuff and I think again, it's just like come to this idea of well, we just need to learn how to process, like sort of process. It takes a, it takes a long time. I'm, I'm a fairly empathetic person, as I think, I, I will, as at least I would like to think that I am. Mm. Sometimes I can't relate to certain things, but I feel like everyone can do that to a certain extent. And you know, seeing with especially with the treatment of autistic adults within workplaces, I think I can't remember the numbers. Please, please find it for me. I think it's like four in ten. Uh, it's a very shock. There's a shocking low number of autistic adults in full time or part time employment. And, you know, the, the people 
again, and I feel like a lot of it is due to stigma and uh, representation within the media. I feel like Dustin Hoffman, sort of, uh, sort of Rayman, for example, which is a, which is a, he's a great actor. But I feel like a lot of people sort of base their interpretation of autistic people on sort of Rayman and stuff like that. Yeah, mm. no, it's um, so it's less than three in ten um, yeah, in work. Yeah, the stat you were looking yeah. for there, yeah. But um, and I think I think another part of that as well is not just the sort of stigma, but also just people. Some people aren't. They're just not. You know, they're not up for that kind of work that is expected of people. Because realistically, I don't think I don't think we as a species are made to be doing a nine to five. Do you know what I mean? Wherein here is your regimented time that you must do this meaningless work. Oh, you work in advertising? Yes, um, we've had to make up this job uh, because we need everyone to have jobs. And so we've created a job where you tell people they need things that they don't need. Um, and actually your job isn't even to do that. Your job is to be a middle person of a middle person of a middle person of a middle person um, and be a little cog in that machine. Uh, it's just jobs so like you're... that that's like, um, like adult daycare to a certain extent. Yeah, but, but basically, yeah. right? And it's just it's just because we need to justify this. And I think that's, I think that's um, probably a, a decent point to end on there that um, when we look into so much of this, capitalism is self-justifying. And I don't mean that in the sense that it actually justifies itself. I mean that in the sense that it needs to justify itself in so many ways. So you have to have everyone working because otherwise people will realize we don't actually all need to work all the, like this amount to have the resources that we have um, or to produce the resources that we need. Um, and when you look at people who are neurodivergent, uh, you see, oh, hold on, this strict model we have of the sort of average or perfect person, um, it is it is pretty bloody flawed. And actually there's a lot of diversity here. And again, maybe we, if we only view things through the lens of how much profit can this person produce in this specific system, maybe that's not the best way of uh, making everyone better off. And when it comes to science as well, you know, maybe, it's not a good idea to have the only incentive that, that exists in our society be just money. Maybe that's a bad idea because then when you come up against things that don't have an inherent monetary value, um, you you then like have to create like you know solutions to get around that constantly more and more, and they obviously then create more and pr more problems in and of themselves, which you then need to slap another sort of plaster on, and it just it just gets more and more complex for a system that is supposed to be about limited government involvement and sort of distributing resources without any sort of centralized, you know, um, centralized control. And it seems pretty evident that it can't do that without killing a whole bunch of people unnecessarily. And that's something we tend to frown upon. We don't, we don't usually want to do that, you know, because killing people, is not great generally. Controversial. Um, yeah, well, mm, <laughs> but this system doesn't seem to be able to do that um, consistently. Uh, you know, meet its goals consistently without a whole lot of people, if not dying, living in really, really poor conditions. And yeah, I mean, there, it's hard to find studies that talk about sort of capitalism in and of themselves. I had some looking at UBI. We didn't really get a chance to chat about that. We could probably do another episode on that because as we it's know- It's like the four day working week, for example. Yeah. That's so much objection to that, working from home, which I felt like a lot of people during the pandemic found, actually, this is quite good. Mm. But basically what you had was like a government and media sort of hit piece on people working from home because it's not in their financial interest for people to be working from home. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with like unis, for example, oh yeah, come back to uni, come back to uni. We're going to have blended learning. Actually, no, we're going to lock you in your accommodation because we need the money to keep ourselves running. Yeah, you basically get to a point, right, where it's really difficult for science to ask questions um, when it's incentivized against doing that. And there aren't a, hu a huge number of studies on capitalism and its effectiveness because it's just taken as a given. And I think that's a problem. I think we should be looking into, you know, the, the sort of issues and limitations and sort of implications of capitalism with a scientific lens far more than we already are. Not from economists, because we, not that we don't like economists, Luke, but- I'm not an economist. I know. <laughs> um, but economists <laughs> like to make models um, and then complain about people not doing what their models say. So maybe we should have people from other disciplines looking at this and genuinely uh, take an evidence-based sort of scientific approach to the system that we let control our entire sort of society and see whether it's working or not, because we're not really doing that as of yet. Um, as this episode has probably shown you, there's very, there's very little out there on 
on what capitalism, like how capitalism affects people. Uh, but go ahead and read those sources. That's pretty much all I've got for you both today, though. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. It's been great to come on. I've, I've really loved it. Thank you. Well, it's been great having you. Corey, I have a request. Could we say thank you to some new patrons, please? Request granted, Luke. Thank you to Mika and me. And you? Are you a patron? No, you are, though. I am. Well, thank you to me, but also thank you to So Walks. And thank you to Fit. Thank you, Avery Man. Thank you, Daniela Ryan. And that is all, because we, um, we filmed these too close together. Again, <laughs> join our Patreon. <laughs> I think there's just one thing left to do. <gasps> it's the quick fire quiz. Dun, 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 oh. dun. Capitalism edition. So the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always. I'll ask one question. That's one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer after I finish asking the question wins. What do they win, Luke? A shiny pound coin. Oh, uh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your buzzer, Luke? Ooh, a pound coin. And what is your buzzer? That's nice, that. <laughs> so my question for you is, um, capitalism good? <laughs> That's not a question. That's a question. It's got a question mark at the end. We just answered that with an entire hour <laughs> podcast. First person to buzz, you get a pound coin. There's a lot up for grabs here. Uh, oh, that's nice, that. <laughs> no, it's shit, mate. There you go. I can't say whether that's correct or not. Um, it's we'll all decide whether yeah. you get your pound coin off air, but I think that's pretty much all for us. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Before we go, we would like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to Executive Producers Danito and Glitch Rabbit. And thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe to new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys, or you can find and contact us at SciGuys Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at SciGuys on TikTok too. <laughs> Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod <laughs> yeah, yeah, at so gmail.com. <laughs> you can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cuffold everywhere. And you can follow me on at the Champagne Socialist on most of my uh, uh, social media platforms. And also my podcast, Not To Get Political, which is available on YouTube and Spotify. Please leave us nice reviews. Otherwise, I'll come over and dash your nan. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>